Uh, thank you so much for, for this opportunity. So I have uh, three short cases to present. And the reason why I picked three is because those are three situations that I think uh, endoscopy is clearly better than what we're doing now. Um, a lot of things, it's just, it's an option. Um, so I have conflict of interest. I'm teaching faculty for JoyMax. And before I went into the cases, I wanted to talk about the types of spine endoscopy. There's uniportal versus biportal, so one port versus two ports. And there's full endoscopy, which is kind of what we did in the lab, versus endoscopic assisted, which is a tube with a camera uh, and or endoscope in it. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the uniportal full endoscopic approach. So the first question that anybody asks themselves, including me when I first started uh, to learn this is, does this work for me? Is this going to be something that is helpful to my practice? Um, it has a super steep learning curve. Um, it treats conditions mostly that we already have good solutions for. People have good um, outcomes overall in the long run. Um, and then, you know, does it, is it worth the decrease in productivity that I have initially? Is it worth, um, you know, potentially some outcomes that are not as good as you would do with a more traditional approach? Um, and then how am I going to sell this to my hospital system? Or is this going to be worth it for my private practice to buy this? So those are the things that everybody thinks about. But then you balance that out with the potential benefits, especially after kind of going through the, the or still going through the learning curve, as what are the benefits of this? And there's a couple that I think it's clear cut. So for thoracic disc herniations, uh, this treatment, uh, I think, is you can even call it in a way, revolutionary. Um, management of patients with very large BMI really helps out with that because what you're doing with the endoscope is you're taking your, your visualization to the level of the lesion. Um, the utilization of the transfer MRI is something that we can't do with open or minimally invasive tubular surgery. It has less tissue manipulation. Um, and um, the last thing is small incision size because like Dr. Anand says, the incision size is not MIS. MIS is kind of going through the areola planes uh, and it's an approach to the spine. But the two things that are important is infection risk is almost zero because you have irrigation the entire time. And the irrigation also serves as a permanent retractor over all the dural elements. So it's not just like one retractor in one little area with dura pooching everywhere. It's a, it retracts all of the dura away, which is really awesome, and it minimizes the the risk of durotomies. There are two approaches to the endoscopic spine, interlaminar and transferaminal. Interlaminar is similar to what we do with a tube. Transferaminal is something that is difficult for us to do with a tube um, because you just need a way smaller working channel to fit in the frame and like, like we saw in the lab. Um, so the interlaminar approach can treat these conditions here. And I'm not really going to talk about these uh, much today. Um, the transferaminal is, is what I'm going to discuss more because I do think that this is a more of a game changer in my opinion. And this is treated or this is used to treat lumbar and thoracic disc herniations and isolated foraminal stenosis. Uh, we talked about Kamben's triangle or Kamben's prism. So with all that, I'm going to go to my first case. So this is a patient that presented, uh, has multiple numerous comorbidities, presented with bilateral lower abdominal and leg paresthesias and problems with walking for a year. He was full strength but clearly myelopathic on exam, and this is his scan. Showed a central disc herniation at T8, T9. He had a neurologic workup that ruled out any other cause to his symptoms and was actually referred to us by neurology for treatment of the central disc herniation. So how did, can we treat this? So we could treat this with a thoracotomy for a TA9 discectomy, possibly fuse at the same time. You could do a posterior lateral approach to reach around the cord uh, to do a discectomy and possible fusion. But another option that endoscopy adds is doing a transferaminal discectomy. Um, and in terms of, and that's what the route that, that, that we chose to take. So in terms of uh, management, important management thing. So this is mid thoracic spine. So uh, I did get IR marking to make sure that localization was easier in surgery. You position the patient prone in an Allen bow frame and neuromonitoring is used uh, to make sure that we don't have a cord injury uh, due to the cannula being uh, you know, in the canal. So in terms of uh, uh, the approach, it's very similar to what we just did in the lab. It's transferaminal approach. You dock on the SAP with a jam sheety needle. This in the thoracic spine, it's usually about eight millimeters off of the midline. It's right where the rib kind of starts curving forward. And then you march up into the rib, and then you go into the costa uh, vertebral uh, area to dock in this area. Um, you take that in. And again, the starting point here is the middle of the pedicle. 
uh, on the AP, and again, a perfect AP, and you're in the posterior vertebral body line on the lateral. You put your cannula in there, and this is a starting position, just like we saw in the lab. Um, during the case, we were able to get a really nice discectomy, got all of it out, saw the cord come down, and as you can see, this is a slide that shows how cranial you can go, how caudal you can go, and how across you can go. So we're across midline with this approach. You could do this bilaterally if you need to get something more on the other side. In terms of the post-op scan, it shows the uh, CT. Um, because he was admitted, I usually get CTs and MRIs on everybody for my education. And it shows the bony opening here through the SAP and through part of the facet, obviously, and part of the pedicle, but very, very small opening. And then this is the MRI post-op showing that the disc is completely gone um, with this approach. So this is something that we're able to do through a six millimeter incision and a guy who has multiple comorbidities saved him from a bigger operation and saved him from potentially needing a fusion. So that's the first uh, case I want to present. The second one is the case of, or a situation where you have a recurrent disc. So this is a patient who I took care of yesterday, had a previous open left L45 microdiscectomy and came in with recurrent symptoms and a recurrent disc herniation, exhausted conservative measures and was a candidate for surgery, um, had a little bit of foot uh, dorsiflexion weakness but otherwise was intact. Uh, this, is, this is her MRI uh, demonstrating a, a far, or lateral recess disc herniation, pretty large, and the CT there showing the previous bony opening. So what are the management options here? You could do a redo open microdiscectomy. You could do a redo tubular uh, microdiscectomy. You could say, you know what, I might need to take more of the facet joint than what is safe, and maybe we should just do a TLF at the same time. And those are all very, very appropriate options. Or you could do a transforaminal discectomy because it minimizes the chance of you having to go through all the scar tissue because it's a fresh plane anterior to, uh, <clears throat> anterior to the thecal sac. Um, so that's the option that we went with, and this is a disc that got pulled out. This is, uh, her, this is actually Dr. Hofstetter's app um, that follows, I know earlier we talked about following patients in terms of the, how many steps they take and how they're doing, so I, I was able to bring the app back with me to Michigan, and this is what she said uh, this morning. So we'll see how she does until her next re-herniation, but for now she's happy, which is good. Uh, so again, that option was great. When I was in there yesterday, there definitely was so much scar on the dura. Uh, I think it was easier for me to get through it from the front and was able to get a humongous disc fragment out, as you can see here. Um, the last case is a large central disc in a patient uh, with a high BMI. So this is a 16-year-old female that presented with uh, left greater than right leg pain, neurologically intact, but really did everything, including injections and physical therapy. Uh, this is this, lady, this is patient's MRI showing a large central disc herniation, and her BMI, I think she was like 50 or 60, something super, super uh, high. Um, so for a patient like this, what could we do? Um, we could do an open microdiscectomy. Maybe we have to go on both sides and take disc out from both sides. Because as we, uh, you know, people that have done this before, pediatric disc is not one piece, it's multiple little chunks. So you might not be able to decompress all the way over to the other side. Um, you could do this either open or tubular. But another thing that you could do is a transforaminal discectomy. The transforaminal route allows you to access, if you start lateral enough, to go all the way over to the other side. And that's what we decided to do. So this is an intraoperative picture showing the, how far the bipolar goes, really all the way over to the pedicle on the other side. Um, this patient got admitted because she's a pediatric patient uh, and went home the next day. So we did get an MRI, which was really good for learning. Um, and it shows that the disc herniation is a lot smaller. Again, there's still a bulge there, but a lot smaller. And I bet you with time that probably all that postoperative change will make it recede even further. Um, and this patient is doing phenomenal, thankfully. Um, and then the last thing is endoscopic TLIF, which uh, you know I put in here because one of the uh, one of the uh, criteria or one of the uh, things that I should that they wanted me to talk about here is endoscopic TLIF, but I'm going to leave that obviously to the uh, master and Dr. Hofstetter later. So those are kind of the procedures that I wanted to talk about. I talked about three cases that I think endoscopy helps uh, a lot with. Um, so obviously, I want to thank thank all the people that have taught me uh, this skill um, all around the world. Um, and in summary, I hope that you got out of this talk that spine endoscopy can be helpful to a spine surgeon. We talked about the two approaches, and we talked about three example cases where I think uh, endoscopy drastically changes uh, the management uh, from what we have uh, available currently. So thank you all so much. Okay, and I think, I don't know what's next. Okay, we're good?
Oh, can I have that? Okay, so it's, still, it's like way too much of, of me. I'm sick of myself now. Yeah, no, thanks, Osama. Those are great cases. And, you know, uh, maybe before you go, like, yeah, course, I, uh, I guess a couple of questions. You know, the thoracic um, endos endoscopic case was actually a great one. I honestly think that has quite a bit or quite a number of advantages over what I, I would do in an open procedure, obviously. I think a lot of, you know, open surgeons would consider fusing it at that point. So that, that, that's a big big game changer. Um, now, the question I have is like, what if it was heavily calcified? I mean, are you able to address that pretty well with an endoscope? Uh, that, that's a great question. I think if, uh, if you're further along in the learning curve, absolutely. I think at this point, I probably would still do open um, and infuse or do a thoracotomy. Um, but I think, you know, in the hands of someone with a lot more experience, absolutely, those calcified discs, because they have an articulating drill that you could use to kind of undercut the, uh, the disc um, and then use something just like what we do in open surgery where you can kind of like uh, put it into the working space that you created. But absolutely doable. Yeah, so and you could go on both sides too. So even if you could just get half of it on one side, go on the other side. Or if you have two surgeons that know how to do this and do it at the same time. I know in Methodist they do this too, where they have two surgeons there that know how to do this and they kind of do transferaminal on both sides at the same time. So those are things that you could uh, potentially do in a heavily calcified situation where you can't, you don't feel comfortable reaching all the way over from one side. I suppose that if, if for whatever reason you did get a ventrodurotomy, um, it really is relatively small dead space. Well, uh, and repair would be fairly challenging. I mean, would you just put fat, fiber and glue, or can that be, can you actually use fiber and glue with an endoscope, or mm -hmm. what would be the options? Yeah, so in terms of uh, treatment of durotomy, so the nice thing about endoscopy, so I spent uh, six months with, with Christoph, and we honestly didn't get a single durotomy. We had one that was like partial thickness. Um, and then I didn't have a durotomy at all until last week. So, um, uh, so the chances of getting a durotomy are low. Obviously, in a calcified disc situation, it's higher than that. But it's very, very easy, because the dead space is small. You just put a piece of uh, dura repair substitute or Duragen, um, and then you turn off the water at the end of the case, and you fill that whole track with fiber and glue, um, and, and it works really, really well. Because again, it's like doing an LP in a way. It's so, such a small incision, and it's so far away. There's so much muscle that collapses before that CSF makes it to you. Yeah. You know, I love your talk. You know, Christoph has done an amazing job, elegantly sort of showing how it can be done right, and we've heard about it for so long. Well, my question to you, though, is like, he's got a lot of experience. You're now the mentee. You're out there. You're in practice. So I'm not sure how many cases you've done. Now, what would you say is like the best case you'd go for, given where you are? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging question. To, or it's a challenging for the reason, like, uh, the best case to start out with is a lateral recessed disc, like a soft disc. Uh, but the reason why I say it's challenging is because, uh, you know, if you talk to some people that have a lot of experience, they say you want to start out with transferaminal first. Mm -hmm. uh, but the anatomy of the interlaminar approach is so, so like, um, not we know about that. That's how we do it with a tube and everything like that. So the question is, definitely the best first case is a la lateral recess soft disc. Uh, but the question is whether it's best to start with a transferaminal or interlaminar. The thing about the transferaminal is once you dock your working channel in, it's stuck. Like you can take your hands off. So, you know, you, it's, it takes time to get facile with the endoscope and know how to angle it and stuff. And you have to do that with the interlaminar approach. Um, with the transferaminal, you don't have to, which is nice. And as you, you saw in the lab, like if you do the, the approach right, you literally land right on the disc. So you turn that thing and you're literally right there. So in my experience, I would say transferaminal, far, or, uh, transferaminal lateral recessed disc is what I would start out with and then uh, go from there. And I'm, uh, now I'm, 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 I think, in my 40s right now in terms of cases doing on my own. Uh, but the nice thing, I was very fortunate that you know University of Michigan let me uh, go for six months to learn this. So uh, even though I'm 40 cases in on my own, I had a lot of cases with him being there, which I think is a special thing that a, a lot of people wouldn't have the opportunity to do. Right. <clears throat> Well, thanks, Osama. So, thank you. I, no, I think we're going to um, progress to the next cadaver.